Hello and welcome to iNerdius and the first video in my series on the 1,000 short stories that I think best represent 20th century science fiction. For the purposes of this series, I'm considering anything below 40,000 words, which is the traditional length of a novel and is also the cutoff for both the Hugo and the Nebula Awards in terms of whether or not the work uh, in consideration is a novel or undeveloped. And I'm also calling anything under 40,000 words for the purposes of simplicity, a short story. Uh, that includes everything down to one word, let's say, even as you'll see, one letter, although not in this video. So first of all, I am not talking about these in any sort of a rank order. I'm really just talking about them as I happen across them. And if I need to reread them, the ones that I've already read, or read them because I haven't read them before, I'm going ahead and doing that. So it's going to take a while to get through this entire series, I'm sure. But um, I want to be able to talk about them as intelligently as possible. And so um, to start off with, the first 10 here are all stories that have been adapted for film and or television and other media. And I'm starting with I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Now, I did talk about I Am Legend for my series on the 100 novels that I think best represent 20th century science fiction, but in actuality, I Am Legend is a novella. And so it's 26,000 words, basically and that does not qualify as a novel. So it was originally published as uh, a gold medal paperback original in 1954. So yeah, a novella can be published as a standalone book. Gold medal uh, paperback originals were uh, started by a distributor when they discovered a loophole in their contracts with other publishers that allowed them to go ahead and publish original paperbacks, and so I Am Legend was one of those. It was made into movies three times, I think maybe even four actually, but I know for sure three. Um, the Last Man on Earth in 1964, The Omega Man in 1971, which I saw um, probably in junior high school on uh, HBO, and it creeped me out, and I Am Legend in 2007. Uh, it represents a last man story, of course, and a global plague story. And probably most importantly, it is uh, a tale of zombies and vampires being the result of scientifically understandable processes. And that is why I think it has um, been so popular for so long and why it stands the test of time. And so... Number one on my list is I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Number two on my list is Rollerball Murder by William Harrison, which was published originally in 1973 in Esquire magazine and was made into a feature film in 1975. And then there was a remake of it in the early 2000s. And I think the influence of the story extends mainly through the 1975 movie, it's a great example of a dystopian corporate society in which there really is no government. Everything is run by giant corporations, including the Energy Corporation, which owns the team that Jonathan E. plays for, E standing for energy, of course. And it makes use of a sport in which people can be killed or kill other people as part of the game and as a way to... Um, you know, it's a sort of distraction for the populace, but also a way to get rid of troublemakers. In this world, in this corporate dystopia, the brand is more important than the individual, let's say. For those reasons, you know, and the idea that I think it was one of the early popularizers of the death game concept in which participants willingly participate, um, I think it has to be included in this list. So that's number two, Rollerball Murder by William Harrison. Now the next few all come from this particular anthology here. Real Future, edited by Forrest J. Ackerman and Gene Stein. And 
This has 16 stories. I'm not talking about all 16 of them. One of them, and this is actually a novel, so I won't be talking about it at all for this particular list, but um, the ones I am talking about start with The Empire of the Ants by H.G. Wells, originally published in 1905 in The Strand magazine, and then again in 1926 in Amazing Stories, and it was made into a B-movie, Empire of the Ants, in 1977. It's a great example of mutated, intelligent, sentient animals, in this case ants, that are capable of utilizing technology, in this case human technology, in the form of a small ship, sailing ship. And I think that's an important idea in science fiction. The next story from that same anthology is Herbert West Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft, originally published in 1922 in an amateur magazine or publication of some sort called Homebrew, something that I think would be akin to a fanzine, perhaps, uh, when I was publishing fanzines in the 80s. And it has been reprinted a number of different times. I think uh, the earliest reprint might have been in 1942 in Weird Tales. And of course, it was made into the 1985 movie Reanimator. And it it is important for H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's fiction in that it is the first time that Miskatonic University is explicitly mentioned and actually has scenes that are set there. Um, it's, as far as I know, the first depiction of zombies created by scientific processes that can be explained, or as I like to call it, science gone awry. And so, and it's a play, of course, on the Frankenstein concept of reanimating a corpse. But of course, uh, as in Frankenstein, things don't go as planned. And H.P. Lovecraft just kind of takes it a lot further uh, than Mary Shelley did, at least in terms of how badly things do go wrong. And so, for those reasons, I have decided to include it in this, uh, in this list. The next story is Who Goes There by John W. Campbell, Jr originally published in 1938 in Astounding Science Fiction, made into the movie The Thing from Another World in 1951 and The Thing in 1982. And I believe there was a prequel made to The Thing, and my understanding is that there is a sequel in the works as well. It was also adapted to radio and television. Very influential story. And it has a lot of interesting, and maybe even originated a lot of interesting science fiction tropes. One of them being the discovery of an alien frozen in Antarctica that is somehow revived, that I guess the freezing process preserved it. And so it was inadvertently revived by the, um, the Antarctic scientific expedition that discovered it. It's sort of an ancient alien story in, in one sense, although not in the sense that I think everybody thinks of that now. But um, it also incorporates a lot of interesting ideas. You have a shape-shifting alien who can absorb and then mimic the creatures that it devours, let's say, and um, has telepathic abilities as well, and so can be aware of when somebody has uh, designs towards it to do it harm or something like that, and also makes it very difficult to come up with a strategy to discover the alien, since it is mimicking other human beings possibly, and destroy it. And so the movies, as far as I know, I've never seen the first movie, but the movies don't utilize that telepathic aspect of the alien. And so because it is so influential, I have decided to include it in this list. Next is Armageddon 2419 AD, which is the intro of the Buck Rogers character, although in, in that story he is actually not called Buck Rogers, he is called basically just Rogers. His name is Anthony Rogers. It was originally published in 1928 in Amazing Stories, uh, and it's by Philip Francis Nolan. I am also including as the next one on this list, The Air Lords of Han, which was published in 1929 in Amazing Stories and is the sequel to Armageddon 2419 AD. And 
they're on this list because essentially they introduce the Buck Rogers character, even though in these particular stories, he is not the same character in a lot of ways that he becomes later on in the comic strips and movie serials and on TV and things like that. Um, but the seeds were planted and Buck Rogers became an incredibly influential character. For example, if you don't have Buck Rogers, then you don't have Flash Gordon. And that's just one example. Uh, these stories, however, are great early examples of what I would call military science fiction. They're not set in, in space. They are set on Earth where a sort of an alien invasion has happened. Um, the idea is that an alien race has, has come to Earth and has uh, intermingled with humans in uh, the Tibet area and created a sort of super intelligent form of human that has then taken over the entire world and the humans who and the normal humans let's call them are uh, in rebellion against them and really want to basically wipe them out and destroy them down to the last individual basically a lot of interesting futuristic military technology is incorporated including uh, the idea of jumpers which are these packs they're not really jet packs but they are things that allow you to jump way high into the air and land without hurting yourself and i kind of feel like that um is something that maybe uh influenced highline for example with starship troopers um and then you also have this idea of an alien human hybrid race of beings and you have this idea of humans you know, trying to overthrow their alien overlords, if you will. Um, and as I said, it was adapted into a very long running uh, comic strip. It was adapted into a number of serials beginning in 1938 and 1939. And uh, of course, there was the 1980s uh, series Buck Rogers, which I used to watch when I was in high school. And um, like I said, it inspired uh, the creation of Flash Gordon, among other, other lesser-known characters. So for those reasons, I decided to include both Armageddon 2419 AD and The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan on this list. And Armageddon 2419 AD is actually in this, is in this book, but I also have this paperback which included both Armageddon 2419 and the Air Lords of Han as a sort of a fix-up novel. But I decided not to include it in the list of the 100 novels because this wasn't published until the 60s and really had already established its influence as, as those two novellas, basically. Um, next, I want to talk about Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes. And this was originally published in 1958 in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. It won a Hugo Award. It was then lengthened into a novel, uh, which won the Nebula Award in 1966. But I think the, the, uh, the influence and I think the importance really belongs to the short story. Um, it was adapted into a movie called Charlie in 1968, and I think it was nominated for an Oscar, and it's been adapted for television and on stage and on, you know, for radio plays, and it's just, you know, one of those stories that has really touched a nerve, I would say, um, and people keep going back to it. And um, it's a great example, probably the best example, of artificially enhanced intelligence in humans. And so the idea is that a scientist has invented a serum that will boost the IQ of, of an individual, and they test it on somebody who has a, a subnormal IQ, and this person becomes a genius, but it doesn't last forever. And being a genius, they they realize this is what's going to happen. They're going to revert back to their subnormal IQ at some point. And before that, it is tested on, on a mouse called Algernon. Uh, and the main character is named Charlie, hence the play Charlie. And I think that just because of its importance as, as a story that utilizes this idea of artificially enhancing intelligence so well and to such effect, 
it deserves to be uh, on this list. And then next, sorry, I have my notes. Next is um, Farewell to the Master by Harry Bates which was originally published in 1940 in Astounding Science Fiction and is in this anthology. And Farewell to the Master was, of course, adapted into the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still in 1951 and then again in 2008. It was one of the early stories in which the alien is not actually a threat to humanity. The alien is just apparently establishing contact and it's, so it's a great idea of sort of how humans misunderstand the intentions of an alien. Now, the way that's portrayed in the short story is different than in, in the movies, but um, it is one of those types of stories. And of course, it has a great twist at the end, which I won't give away. Um, the story is definitely different, though. And the way the alien and the giant robot are portrayed in in the movies versus in the short story, I think are also uh, are also different, but it's a very influential story. Um, and uh, that is why I have decided to include it in this list. And finally is The Racer by Ib Melchior. And it was originally published in 1956 in Escapade and was adapted into the movie Death Race 2000 in 1975. And then again into the movie Death Race and three sequels to that movie in the 2000s. And of course, Death Race 2000 really is what I think made that story so well known. And the movie is definitely far more expansive uh, on the idea than the short story. But the short story, you know, is what contains the, the, the seed, the kernel of that idea. And is, is a pretty quick and easy read, for one thing. And um, Again, it's this idea of the death game, of the sport in which part of the part of the purpose, part of the point of the sport is to kill people. <laughs> um, and that is a really, you know, for some reason, that is that is an idea that really sort of uh, uh, works for a lot of people. And the, the society and the short story isn't really well established. You get the impression it's pretty much normal. Um, as normal as can be in, in, in allowing such a race to happen, let's say. And so through the movie, I think it is uh, extremely influential, again, as Rollerball Marker was through the movie Rollerball, which also came out in 1978. So anyway, there you have it. Those are the first 10 stories in my imaginary anthology of the 1,000 short stories that I think best represent 20th century science fiction. I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, Rollerball Murder by William Harrison, The Empire of the Ants by H.G. Wells, Herbert West, a Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft, Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr., Armageddon 2419 A.D. and The Air Lords of Han by Philip Francis Nolan, Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, Farewell to the Master by Harry Bates, and The Racer by Ib Melchior. Thank you very much.